Now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, join me on the phone. And this is actually very, very exciting. It is the one and only John Oates from Hall & Oates. And of course, having grown up in the 80s, Hall & Oates were everywhere on uh, Much Music up here in Canada and, of course, MTV and FM and AM radio. Uh, and as we say uh, in uh, Montreal, uh, bonjour, Monsieur Alain Niven. Here is a co-host, Alan Niven. Good day, sir. How are you? Bonjour. Um, still alive and breathing, um, which is an achievement these days. Um, John Hall. Um, I have to say that there was a record called Abandoned Luncheonette, and I would have to say that it's got to be about 1973 or something. And there was a song on that album called She's Gone. And I tell you, if they never made another record or never wrote another song, just of that one song, they had made a huge mark on my consciousness. I just love that song. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, it is. And uh, during the interview, I mentioned that to uh, to John that you were a big fan. So uh, so do listen for his response. Now he's got a new album out called Live in Nashville, in which he explores his Americana and roots roots, I guess, for the lack of a better word. Uh, speaking of new music, and you said, you know, with that song, if they had never done anything else, that would have been fine and dandy. They were working on a new album, their first in, I guess, 12, 13, 14 years. And then COVID hit and they haven't been together and they haven't been writing and they haven't been demoing. And during the interview, John sort of says, well, we've kind of abandoned it for now. How important do you think it is for a band like Hall & Notes in 2020 to come up with new music because listen, we, they can go to a, a concert venue, Madison Square Garden, put their names up. Whoop, we're here, play all the big songs, Man Eater, and all that stuff, and they'll sell out. How how important do you think it is for them to to have a, a creative spark? I think composing um, compulsion depends on the individual, and it's whether they feel they need to do it or not. Um, I mean, there was a point in my life where one of my greatest heroes, Bob Dylan, I'd, I would, I'd got to a point of, why do you ever make another record after all the records you've already made? What more could you possibly say? And then he released a thing called Oh Mercy, which totally destroyed me. I thought that was one of the most brilliant records ever made, Oh Mercy. And obviously he'd gotten to a point where he had perspective, he had a sense of purpose, and he had some statements that he wanted to form and fashion, and he did so brilliantly. If you don't own that record, that's a record that you really need to go and, and spend some time with. Um, but the compulsion to create, I think, is a personal aspect, and I think that if somebody is merely generating product, because they feel obliged to, or because somebody's asking them to, then, you know, you're reducing yourself from an artist to a mere entertainer. Um, when you've got something to say, say it, and say it well. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I was listening to all of that, and uh, you said Bob Dylan, and all I could think about was uh, writing songs with Gene Simmons, uh, and then everything else went to blank. So, uh, yeah, that was great. Oh, you were, th you were, you were thinking about Gene Sh Simmons? Yes, Gene Simmons um, and, and Bob Dylan now, writing songs now, together. It's the greatest time now, ever. Now, forever, now forever, every time I think of Bob Dylan, I'm going to think of him playing just like a woman for a 16-year-old beauty called Sharon Stone and think, you dog. But also admit that had I n written that song myself and had I been able to play it for Sharon Stone... I would have. Do you think when he was writing with Gene Simmons, he he, he picked up the, picked up his guitar and said, "Gene, Gene, ah, well, let me try rock and roll all night for you. Let, let's see what Bob Dylan sounds like doing rock and roll all night." Arr. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. No, picturing. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. The only thing that that uh, Bob Dylan took away from Gene Simmons was face paint. Um, I think, as far as Gene being a craftsman, a musician, or a lyricist. 
Bob was probably like, well, this is an animal I don't really understand, but the face paint is interesting. Now, now speaking of interesting, let, let's get over to, to John Oates. He is uh, back with a new album called John Oates and the Good Band. Before we do, yes. Before we do, yeah, yeah. Um, I know this has only just come across the uh, the news wire, the airwaves. I just want to make it make make a comment on the passing of Martin Birch and just acknowledge what an extraordinary career and how extraordinarily productive he was. Um, and if I remember correctly, I think he produced my favorite White Snake song, Love Ain't No Stranger. He might have been. I mean, look at his career. I mean, he, he's been involved as an engineer or producer or mixer with Fleetwood Mac, Deep Purple, John Lord, Wishbone Ass, Rainbow, White Snake. Black Sabbath, Blue Oyster Cult, Iron Maiden, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One of the greatest, well, I mean, he's not just a producer. He was producer, engineer, just one of the greatest musical guys, for the lack of a better word, that ever was. And, and you look at the albums. I mean, if it wasn't for Martin Birch, would Iron Maiden be where they were? I mean, Number of the Beast, Peace of Mind, Power Slave, Live After Death, Somewhere in Time. I mean, just go on and on and on, Fear of the Dark. The guy he did ten albums with them. Yes, I mean it, it's unbelievable. He gave them their career, and then you look at the stuff he touched with White Snake. I mean, Ready and Willing is by far their most underrated album. And if I had to choose, I would probably listen to it before a lot of the other White Snake's al albums. And of course, Slide It In, Saints and Sinners. I mean, my my lord, what what an incredible, incredibly talented guy, and what a big, big loss. Now, of course, he hadn't really done any production or any work on albums in in many, many years. But so oh, he, what? He's, Look what he left he, us. He, I think I think he retired about twenty five years ago, um, something like that. But you know, there's somebody who made a contribution. And when you look at what people do with their lives, energy, you know, tip of the cap, Martin Birch. Um, you could have been a lawyer, but no, you helped make cool records. Yeah, which, and that's a contribution. Which has been a, a, a soundtrack to many, many people's lives. And so uh, on that tip of the hat to, uh, to Martin Birch, of course, may you rest in peace. And uh, we will go over here over to John Oates and the Good Road Band live in Nashville comes out September 18th. Here is the one, the only John Oates. We are speaking with uh, John Oates. Uh, of course, he has uh, John Oates and the Good Road Band alive in Nashville coming out in September. And as we say here in Montreal, uh, bonjour, John. How are you? Um, well, how are you? <laughs> very, very well. And w what a great pleasure to talk to you again. We've done this before and it was fantastic. And I'm glad we, we get a second chance. Um, Talk to me a little bit about this about this live album because we're really talking about Americana. We're talking about Roots. Uh, it's sort of a well, not sort of. It is a follow up to the Arkansas album from a couple of years ago. Just uh, mm -hmm. talk to me about performing these songs and what it means to you. Well, you know, the uh, you're hundred percent right when you say it is kind of a, a follow on from the Arkansas project. Um, when I started that album about almost, what, two and a half years ago, maybe even longer, um, I assembled a band. It was the same band in the studio that recorded the Arkansas album that has become the Good Road Band. And since that album had been released a few years back, we've been touring a lot, played a lot of shows, developed a really cool live show uh, based on the music from Arkansas. And then as time went on, it evolved with, uh, to include other songs from my solo work and some covers and various things. Um, and what was happening was, uh, you know, if we wind back to the beginning of 2020, I was about to embark uh, with Daryl Hall on a 40-city uh, tour, uh, which was going to take up most of my time in 2020. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to, probably put the Good Road Band and uh, all this music uh, on the shelf for a bit, uh, you know, while I, you know, put my Hall & Oates hat on, so to speak. And, um, but as uh, you, we all know, that that didn't work out so well for the world. Um, and, uh, you know, no t the tour was canceled and, um, you know, we're all where we're at in terms of, uh, you know, the COVID thing. And um, right before um, I kind of shut it down in January, um, I booked a show at the Station Inn in Nashville. 
And it's the place where this band, where the Good Road Band basically started. That's where we cut our teeth as a band, uh, kind of put our first shows together. And I thought it would be uh, fitting to go back to the same venue and uh, do, you know, kind of, uh, I guess you'd call it the my version of the last waltz, so to speak. Um, and uh, so we booked the show at the Station Inn and recorded the show, and it came out amazing. And then, of course, the world shut down shortly thereafter. So I was sitting on this incredible um, live performance. Uh, the, the band was playing really well. We mixed it. It sounded great. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, I, I can't just, you know, ignore this. And uh, because there is no live music, uh, I thought, wow, maybe I'll release a live album. You know, in a way, you know, it's it's a it's a substitute. It's not it's not a substitute for a live show by any means. But you know, people still want music, and um, I wanted the world to hear this great band, and that's how the project evolved. And, and it's a great sounding project. Now, when you did the Arkansas album, you had said in the media that it was the record that you had always wanted to make. Talk to me about that a little bit, because, you know, obviously the, some of the Hall & Oates stuff, especially in the 80s, was very pop-oriented, very MTV-oriented, but this is very different. Talk to me about wanting to make this and paying tribute to Mississippi John Hurt. Well, you know, before I met Daryl Hall, um, my music, my individual uh, roots and in influences were really based around roots music, and that roots music could could have been anything from Appalachian, folk bluegrass, delta blues, ragtime, um, early the early days of rock and roll from the Chuck Berry and Little Richard era uh, to, um, you know, to the early days of R&B, you know, the, the Memphis, Stax Volt, stuff like that, um, stuff that, you know, that, that came out of uh, Muscle Shoals. So that was really who I was as a musician. Um, that, you know, that guy... The, those influences kind of got parked on the side of the road over the years was as Daryl and I developed our own individual sound. And, you know, we, we, we went down the road that we went down and uh, the pop, you know, music that we created was uh, a function of him and I working together. Our, our more, you know, our influences in the seventies and the eighties living in New York city and Philadelphia and all that. So, but, but nevertheless, the, those, those early influences never really left. They were just, shelved really for a while. Um, when I moved to Nashville and became part of the Americana music community, I began to find some kindred spirits who really knew the same, had the same influence as me, uh, had this, we, we could uh, talk, we had the same musical lexicon really. And uh, I began to surround myself with, with these players and folks. And it, it began to, it began to reignite my memories of, of, the, of my earliest musical influences. And from there, it evolved as, as I, you know, as I have, you know, kind of grown and matured as a person and as a musician, I've taken that, uh, that my earliest influence as a jumping off point and now kind of made new music, but having it informed by this earliest, earliest influences. Talk to me a little bit about uh, the fact that at this point in your career, you you have the freedom to put out albums like this and, and like Arkansas, because in, in 1981 or 82, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but if you went to the record company with the, one of these two records, they would have said, yeah, okay, John, that, that's real cute. Now, get back to making us MTV video <laughs> hits, right? I mean, that's what they would have said. They would have, they would have told you that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's funny. That, yes, the way you put it is, is very close to what would have happened. Yeah, so 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 talk to me now about having that freedom to to be able to be as creative as you want and to do what you want and not have to work within a box anymore. Well, it's a function of of um, success. Success uh, does does afford the opportunity to uh, to experiment and to step outside of boxes. Uh, so I, I never take for granted the, the success that I've had with Daryl um, and the Hall and Oates, uh, you know, legacy that has allowed me to do this. Um, and I'm very, very respectful and, and very, you know, um, cognizant of, of how important that, that success has, has given me that platform to do whatever I want. The other, uh, I think the other aspect of that is, is that the times, you know, uh, the times have changed. Um, the breakdown of the, of the uh, big record company paradigm of the old days uh, has allowed artists, you know, uh, to, 
basically step outside of, of any box they want. Now, whether they find success by doing it, that's another story. Um, I'm fortunate enough to not need to do it, you know, to make a living, but at the same time, um, I, I love doing it and I'm allowed to do it. So it's, a um, you know, I, I'm in a very fortunate position. I think, I think every artist really, their ultimate, their, if they had a wish list, you know, on the top of that wish list would be, I'd like to be able to do anything I want and have people listen to it. I think that could be very high on any creative person's, uh, whether that's a musician, a painter, or, you know, a poet, or, you know, who, who knows. Um, you know, to be free to, to create and have people accept it or at least have the opportunity to, uh, to let people, you know, experience it, that's probably the ultimate goal of any creative person. So having, uh, you know, having arrived at that place, I, I feel very fortunate. And I don't, and as I said earlier, I don't take it for granted. Nor should you, but I, I'm still just trying to figure out what a RCA boardroom would have looked like in 1982 had you walked in with this. But uh, <laughs> right, um, but but in terms of, of stretching into Americana and, and this roots music, do, do you see yourself now with this freedom to to, or do you want to experiment in other things and do I don't know classical guitar album or or a more pop oriented disco? We I mean. Do you want to stretch into other areas, or you say no, no, no? This this is where I want to be, and back to Hall of Notes after. I think I'll always, always. This will always be part of my musical um, legacy. Now, I think I've established myself in that world. Uh, I've made a number of albums, going back to to two hundred seven, two hundred ten, with Mississippi Mile and Thousand Miles of Life, um, and you know so. Having, I think it took me a few albums and, and some years of, of commitment to, to kind of convince the world that I was for real in that arena. Now that I've done that, and I think I, you know, I've been accepted there, um, you know, I, now I'm actually thinking about, a, a, you know, to answer your question, I'm actually beginning to write a little bit more contemporary things that sound a little bit more, you know, I guess you'd say pop, but not really, just something a little bit more in the lines of original material and that that's not rooted in the in the past um the, you know the the music of arkansas and the music of of this live album are really based on on music that has come before me now i'm i'm starting to make music that is totally original and moving forward now wh- how how where that really ends up, I'm not sure. Daryl and I talked about perhaps making a record, but that has been put on hold because of the world situation. Uh, but during that period of time, I've been writing some songs that I think sound like what a contemporary Hall & Oates record might be. Um, I'm working on a movie project, uh, an amazing film project called Gringa, which is a great story about a young girl who goes to Mexico looking for her father. And um, I've written three songs for that, the title song, the end credit song, and another song for that. So I've been very much involved with the film company, and that's been an exciting thing. Uh, Working with different artists, a young hip-hop singer from uh, South Carolina, uh, and I have collaborated on one of those film songs. Um, And I'm working with a Mexican female singer to do a duet for one of the other songs, which will be released as a Latin single as well. So yeah, so there's a lot of really cool things happening. And here again, I've, I've kind of, you know, having done this live from Nashville album with the Good Road Band, I've, I've said, okay, you know, I made my statement. This is what it is. We can come back to it. We can revive it at any time. But for now, it's time for me to do something else. And it's a great project. Uh, you did mention that you were working on an album with uh, Daryl. And uh, before you went on the road with or, or were starting the tour with the Squeeze and KT, Tun- KT Tunstall, uh, you were talking about this new album. Now that it's been delayed, uh, do you see you getting back to that soon and also when you're working on a new album like that, do you have to go back to the 80s, early 80s, and and create a new album like that? Or how do you sort of create a new Hall & Oates album in terms of sound? Is it, we got to capture the past and sort of be like ACDC and give the fans what they expect? Or do you move forward and go, oh, no. Not not, not from my point of view. I don't know what Daryl's thinking about. We never got past first base on this project. You know, we were talking about doing it. Daryl had been working with a a young, a a very young uh, producer, uh, from Holland that he discovered that he really liked and he thought could bring something really interesting to the collaboration. But we, it never got past that. 
um, the thing just fell apart, and Daryl and I never pursued it. So I'm sure he's writing on his own. I'm sure he's thinking about it. I've already written a bunch of songs that I think could be cool. But no, there's no way that I would even think about using the 80s as a, as a jumping off point. Uh, not at all. I think that, to me, I, I'm not nostalgic. I don't go backwards. Um, but, you know, there would be a, there's a certain chemistry and there's a certain sound that happens when Daryl and I get together. And I think we would let it evolve naturally. And whatever that is, it would be. And that, that would be. Um, just real quick, the, uh, the album Voices came out on uh, July... 29th 1980 so we're, we're sort of just right around that corner celebrating this time it features uh, Chuck Berge on drums who happens to be a personal friend um, just real quick on that how important was that album because it really sort of in my opinion defined the band moving forward and, and it was sort of like the starting point of you know Hall & Notes 2.0 career if, if that's fair to say um, just a quick memory of that album and what it meant to the band you're 100 percent right um, in what you said. Uh, it, it, is, it was a very important album in our in our history. Um, probably one of the most important. Uh, the album we had made prior to that was called Ecstatic, and um, we st we started that album with David Foster producing. Uh, David Foster had produced the album prior to that called Along the Red Ledge, and um, we did that in Los Angeles. Uh, David was, of course, based in Los Angeles. He wanted to record in Los Angeles. We wanted to record in New York. So he reluctantly came to New York, um, and we began recording. About halfway through the Ecstatic album, he said, I don't know why, what, you know, what I'm doing here, you guys. You guys are making the record you want to make. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like I'm really necessary. We finished the project, but at that point, that was the, that was the, you know, the, the writing was on the wall, Daryl, and I said, well, next rap album, you know, we won't even, we won't need a producer, we'll just do it ourselves. And that was the Voices album. So the fact that we produced ourselves, the fact that we did it with our road band, here again, as opposed to studio musicians, here again, the, the, those, two, those two factors were huge. And that's what really set the course for the success of the 80s. Um, we made the music sound the way we wanted it to sound. Uh, it was pure, it was... Uh, was unfiltered and, and not very, uh, not, not overly thought out. Uh, we just went for it. And, uh, you know, I think it set the, it set the, the tone for, as you said, 2.0, if you want to call it that for the, for the 80s of success and the sound of the 80s, which evolved further as we developed the other 80s band, you know, with, with GE Smith and Mickey Curry and uh, T-Bone and Charlie Deshant. And that 80s band was really the band that, that propelled us through the, you know, the following albums and all that commercial success. Yeah, so I'm going to follow up on two things because uh, you mentioned another friend, Mickey Curry, great drummer. Um, just uh, quickly talk to me about Mickey because he's, he's a Canadian guy. Actually, he's not a Canadian guy. He's from Connecticut. Um, mm -hmm. But he runs off with a Canadian guy, Brian Adams, eventually does Reckless and all that other stuff. What was that like at that time period where you know that he's flirting with the Brian Adams camp, but he's also your guy and he's just one of, the, I think to me, one of the most underrated drummers. I mean, he, he just plays the heck out of anything, whether it's The Cult or Brian Adams or Hall & Oates. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about Mickey Curry. Well, Mickey Curry was a completely unknown quantity. He had been playing in bar bands and local Connecticut bands. Uh, he had never really had a lot of pro experience. Uh, G.E. Smith, uh, our guitar player, knew him and recommended him when we were looking for a drummer. So Mickey Curry came in and basically, you know, he... He evolved and developed, you know, along with us. Um, and after the second album, after a Private Eyes, I believe, um, Bob Clearmountain became an engineer and co-producer. And Bob Clearmountain and Mickey Curry really clicked um, as an engineer and drummer. And Clearmountain loved the way he played. Uh, and Clearmountain helped Mickey develop his drum sounds and started sampling his kit and experimenting with mic, mic placement and uh, a lot of really, really um, things that were getting into the digital realm. Um, and uh, really, you know, they would spend a lot of time in the studio just working on drum sounds. And Mickey really um, learned along with Bob Clearmountain how to be, you know, how to tune his drums, how to really make his drums sound great. Uh, and when... You know, when Daryl and I began our, um, you know, began to kind of cut back in the mid-80s and realize that we were going to take a hiatus, 
uh, Bob Clearmountain, of course, was producing Brian Adams, and Bob Clearmountain said, well, I got the drummer for you, and brought Mickey along with him, and that's how Mickey became Brian Adams' drummer. This is stolen right from under you, and I'll finish on the Hollow Note stuff just with this. On the Voices album, of course, you have Every Time You Go Away. It ends up being a number one single, but for Paul Young a few years later. Uh, just talk to me about that song and, and you know, wh- why did it sort of go under the radar for Hall of Notes, but then, you know, Paul Young takes it and whoops, it's all over the place. Uh, just quickly talk to me about that song and, and your reaction to seeing Paul, Paul Young on the charts going, hey, that's our song. <laughs> well, if you look at the, okay, that, that song, Every Time You Go Away was the last song on the B side of the Voices album. Now, back in the old days, the last song on the B side of a record was usually, it was usually a really long song or something that just didn't seem to fit with the rest of the album. It was always that kind of like runner. It was like that bring up the rear kind of uh, place. Um, not that we didn't like it. We loved the song, but we wanted to do it. And we, if you listen to the production and the way we approached it, we did it exactly like a, like a Booker T and the MGs. It sounds like a Stax Bolt record. Um, very raw, very real rhythm section, no, not too much adornment, no real, you know, arrangement involved. Uh, and that's how we heard the song. We heard it like a, kind of like a Sam and Dave or Otis Redding song. Um, and so we recorded it that way. Uh, to his credit, Paul Young and his producers heard it and said, hey, we can make a pop song out of this. And they completely reimagined it uh, in that way that many English bands take American roots music and re, re, uh, reimagine it. Um, very, very much of an English pop tradition to do that. And, you know, uh, that's what exactly what Paul Young did. And they did a great job of turning a very rootsy, raw R&B song into a radio friendly pop song. Yeah, they, they, they really did. And, and, and by the way, uh, speaking to Tom Worman, the producer back in the day, he would always say that the before last track on side B is where he would hide the song he didn't like because <laughs> he didn't want people to finish the album with a bad song, which I always thought was kind of funny. Um, back to Mississippi, John Hurt, and some of your earlier influences. Um, when you started making those albums in the 80s, and it was more popular, talk to me a little bit about where, you know, your the bands you liked growing up, because these are not Chuck Berry necessarily or Elvis. Uh, talk to me about those sort of early influences. Well, you know, when I was a, when I was about in sixth grade, I can't remember, I think it was about sixth or seventh grade, I had a friend whose uh, older brother went off to college. He went to a college in North Carolina. And when he came back um, at Christmas time, the folk boom was happening on college campuses. And he came back with a stack of albums of people I had never heard before. Um, Buffy St. Marie, Hetty West, um, John Jacob Nile, uh, Doc Watson, Joan Baez, and so on and so forth. And so I began to listen to these records. And being a guitar, you know, I had started playing guitar at six. So by the time I was 12 or so, you know, I'd already been playing for six years. I wasn't that good, but I was good enough to try to pick what was happening uh, and figure out what was happening on these records. And the more I got into these records, I fell in love with them. And I started learning these techniques and delving into these, uh, you know, this, this folk, folk music and blues and John Lee Hooker and, you know, uh, Muddy Waters, things like that. uh, And Mississippi John Hurt. And as the, as the sixties rolled on, I continued to do that uh, and then moved to Philadelphia and got involved with the early folk scene in Philadelphia and met a guy named Jerry Ricks, who became my, who was my guitar teacher, and also became my mentor in, in, in a, of sorts. And uh, Jerry Ricks was very much involved with a guy named Dick Waterman, who was bringing, who was managing a lot of these early uh, roots performers. And Dick would bring Mississippi John Hurt, Robert Pete Williams, uh, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, Doc Watson, bring them up to Philadelphia for to play the folk festival or the coffee houses. And they would stay at his house or they would stay at Jerry Ricks's house. And I got a chance to meet some of these folks, see them play, uh, see them firsthand. Uh, and uh, it was a, you know, a life, life-altering experience that, you know, being at the right place at the right time. So that was, you know, that's how I, that's how I, I, I got the, the authentic experience as opposed to, 
you know, that, that could transition beyond just hearing them on a record. Yeah, just great stuff. And, and I know we're going to run out of time, so I'll just ask you uh, two last questions, if possible. My, uh, my co-host on the show is Alan Niven, who managed Guns N' Roses and Great White back in the day. His absolute favorite song of all time is She's Gone by, of course, uh, Hall & Notes. Um, talk to me a little bit about that song and, and sort of the lost love that it talks about and, and just how much, how important is it to the, the band's success? Because it, it comes out at first, doesn't do much on the pop charts, you know, up to number 60. And then you re-release it a couple of years later, goes all the way, to, you know, top 10. Uh, just talk to me about sort of believing in that song and giving it a second chance and just overall what it means to you. Well, it got a second, third and fourth chance. Uh, <laughs> um, that I, I, you know, I call that song the the, the, the perfect storm of uh, of of our career. It was, uh, you know, it was a well written song, uh, something that Daryl and I collaborated on equally. Um, it was very honest and very real, and then it was put into the hands of a consummate record producer, Reef Martin who surrounded us with some of the greatest musicians in New York City at the time, in the early 70s. And they brought the song to life. Um, and the song, you know, in the, at the Atlantic Studios, everything about, about that exper- recording experience was just, it was just almost, uh, you know, predestined and meant to be. I don't want to sound too hippy-dippy about it, but that's how, kind of how it was. Um, so the song, yeah, as you said, was released. It didn't do much, but it became what was known in those days as a turntable hit, meaning it got played a lot. People really fell in love with it. It was a huge song on college campuses, um, but it just didn't have the, some sort of pop appeal. It just it missed the mark there. And then the group Tavares recorded it and had a number one R&B record with it, which for me and Daryl, coming from the Philadelphia R&B tradition, didn't surprise us at all. Uh, we were thrilled that it got the, notor- not- the not- notoriety from from Tavares's version of it. Uh, Lou Rawls also recorded it at, uh, shortly thereafter. That Gamlin Huff uh, produced, and uh, so you know it was like one of those things that was just bound to happen. Finally, we had moved from Atlantic Records to RCA, and we had Sarah Smile and Rich Girl. And when we had those hits, uh, Atlantic Records, who still own the master for She's Gone decided, hey, we better release this again on the coattails of Sarah Smile and see if we can, you know, and that's when it finally went into, the, you know, I think it went to number two. Yeah. Um, so that's what happened with that record. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things that just, um, over the years, it's just been a, a you know, it's, it's, a ti- it's a timeless song that sounds as good today as it did when it was written. Well, you know, I have to say, I probably would say that for most of your of your catalog, you know, there, there's very few bands that, that can sound great 20, 30, 40 years later. You know, Aerosmith, the Rolling Stones, they, they, they sort of have it. And then, of course, you've got all these bands in the 80s with the Lim drums and the Simmons drums, and you go, oh, God, stop, stop. But uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, just real quick, and I'll finish with this. The, the last show that you played was, of course, at Madison Square Garden at the end of February. Right. Um, talk to me about about that and having to cancel the tour, and also playing Madison Square Garden. Because when you look back in history and you say Led Zeppelin at Madison Square Garden, Kiss at Madison Square Garden, and whoever at Mad, it's like it's the the epiphany. It's it's the moment. It's the it's this the ultimate thing. Um, if that happens to be your last show ever, and we're hoping it's not, just what's it like playing at Madison Square Garden, especially thirty years after the last time you had played there. Well, I, I'm sorry to correct you, but it wasn't. It was actually only two years after the last time we played there. Oh, look at that! Um, Bad research. <laughs> we played. We played there with. Uh, we played there with. Um, uh, not train. We played there with uh, Tears for Fears. About uh, three years. I guess it was three years ago. But anyway, yes, um, we thought. Okay, you know, we put a lot of we put a lot of energy into the production of this 2020 production. We had had a really cool, unique production. We loved the idea that Squeeze was on the bill with KT Tunstall. We thought, what a great package. What a great year this is going to be. And we go and sell out Madison Square Garden. And about five days before that, I had my gallbladder removed. Uh, I had emergency gallbladder surgery, which I was not expecting. And I I didn't know if I was even going to be able to play, but I managed to get through it. And um, I was just, I was happy on a lot of levels to, to one, 
be able to make do the show and two to have been have it sold out and have this as the kickoff to this amazing 2020 tour and of course you know as we all know the rug got pulled out from all of us and that was the end of it so i uh so i guess we we can honestly say we went out on top here in 2020 um but um hopefully we uh, we just announced a 2021 schedule uh, if if we can do it, we're going to do it. And if we can't, we'll figure out something else to do. So uh, this is how the world is right now, and you just have to roll with it. Well, at, le- at least you're rested up. So when it's time to go again, <laughs> you, you know, you'll be you'll be good to go. Yeah. And, of course, uh, folks, uh, John and Oates yeah. and, the, and the Good Road Band live in Nashville comes out in September. John, first interview was great. Second one was great. Thank you so much. Always, always a pleasure. And uh, just oh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, thank you for all the music, by the way, over the years. Having grown up, uh, you know, at that MTV thing, man, Hall and Notes spent a lot of time in my uh, living room TV. So thank you. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate it. it was a, that was a good interview? Yes, yes. Good questions. I always like that. Thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, anytime. And and when the band does hit the road in 2021, maybe let's do another one, or let's do another one when you put out your next solo album or <laughs> sure. are we no, by the good. way are we calling this a solo album or is this a band album it's a, it's so- a solo song. album but you know it, it, the band is really it, it, this is all about me playing with that band because the band brings so much to the music yeah they, they really do and i've heard a few of the tracks and it just sounds great uh merci monsieur thank you thanks appreciate it spread the word buddy absolutely will do cheers okay thank bye-bye you. bye-bye